So what happens in the stage one? Stage one, there's a redistribution. That means redistribution of pulmonary vessels towards more towards the apex. There's a cardiomegaly, there's a broad vascular pedicle. And this happens when the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is between 13 to 18. When the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is between 18 to 25, you start getting the uh, curl is nine, you start getting the peribronchial cuffing, hazy counter of the vessels, thickening, uh, thickened inter interlobar fissures. And when there is, once there is a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is more than 25, you start getting consolidation, air bronchoma. Uh, you can see consolidation, air bronchogram, cotton wool appearance, and pure effusion. So the most important test which we do in heart failure is an echo. And the echo is a test which provides not only about the functioning of the heart, it also tells about the cardiac chamber, the size, structure, the ventricular function. It also tells us about the walls, how the walls are moving, is any leakage happening, and what about the hemodynamic par parameters in the patient. So by ECHO, we can differentiate whether the heart failure, which, have, which is happening to the patient, is systolic or diastolic heart failure. We can know whether the patient has got a dilated, restrictive, or constrictive cardiomyopathy. We can know whether the heart failure is right-sided, left-sided. We can have, we can also have a non uh, labeling the, the patients. From patient has got a breathlessness, you can rule out our cardiac conditions, you can delabel and you can tell that the heart failure is probably not related to heart. It can be related to secondary factors like anemia, thyroid disorder. So in that condition, ECHO is very useful. Then you can rule out something like an hypertrophy obstructive cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy can be differentiated. Some patient with, who comes with a severe heart failure and very high blood pressures, we can rule out conditions like hypertensive heart failure. So these are things which, which probably an ECHO can help us. Then like other imaging techniques, we can have CT and MRI, which can rule out cardiomyopathies, can tell us about pericardial thickness, exact volumes of the, the different chambers, by which we can know whether the chambers are dilated or not. We can calculate exact left ventricular or right ventricular ejection fractions. We can have LV variability. And most important, we can also rule out CT coronary angiogram. It can be done to rule out obstructions and calcium score. When I have this image, um, you can see that, I mean, if someone can guess it, you can see that there is a thickening. The pericardium is very thickened in this, which is very, very obvious in this. This is a CT picture, which is showing thickened pericardium. This is a classical appearance of constrictive pericarditis in a patient who has a very thickened pericardium. So this is a diagnostic, this thing. Another uh, image which you can see here is, 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 is of a, you know, anybody can guess it. It's very obvious that there's a septum, which is very thickened. You can see this is the septum, which is very thickened. This is the white is the contrast which is within the lumen of the left ventricle. So this is a septal hypertrophy. You can see that in the center. So this is this case is a case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And this is a picture of a cardiac MRI. So cardiac MRI differentiating between normal heart and an HOCM. So this can easily be found without you can not only you can see the, the hypertrophic muscles, what you can see is also you can see the fibrosis. Uh, you can have, you know, see what is happening to the to the muscles. In that way, in, in terms of fibrosis, necrosis, you can also predict whether these patients are, are high incidence of sudden death can happen in these patients or not. So uh, MRI can give you a lot of lot of information in, in a patients of cardiomyopathy. There's another case where the, the CT coronary angiogram has been done to look for the blocks. Now, by doing this, you can rule out ischemia. You can you can you can rule out for uh, coronary artery disease or atherosclerotic heart disease in patients who have who have heart failure. You can do a conventional angiogram also. This also you can do. You can see you can calculate a calcium score in this, and by calcium score you can do you can make you can find it out what is the 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 pro probably prognosis over a period of time, how these patients will behave, or what is the total atherosclerotic load of this patient. So I've just come with uh, one one lab picture of a patient with uh, with um, you know iron profile in this. And if you see the iron is two, total iron binding uh, uh, capacity is 24. The transferrin saturation is eight, ferritin is 22. Now this patient uh, has, has got a severe iron deficiency. I mean, these are the patients probably will require an iron. So uh, we have seen that patients with the heart failure, one of the uh, adjunct treatment other than the routine heart failure medication is, is the treatment of Iron. I mean, they have an iron deficiency. Can happen because of multiple reasons. Can happen because of the congested. Um, first of all, they are 
the patients of heart failure, they are a poor feeder, they don't eat well, they are nutritionally deficient. There's an edema in the intestine, elementary canals, the absorption of iron is poor in these patients. Then because of the multiple tests happening in these patients, they keep on losing blood in multiple tests. Some people, because of the multiple various medicines, can have an asymptomatic or unnoticed GI bleed as well. So iron deficiency anemia, in fact, uh, the, the, the production of erythropoietin is also deals in patients of heart failure. So they can have an iron deficiency anemia. So if you have a patient, just find it out, the ferritin. And if the ferritin is between 100 to 299, just find out what is the transferrin saturation. So if it is less than 20, the patient has got an iron deficiency. Look for the hemoglobin. If the hemoglobin is on the lower side for female and male correspondence, then you, this, you give this patient IV um, iron, iron uh, the deficiency anemia to be to be diagnosed, and patients should should re receive IV iron. So that is what is important. That iron uh, replacement is a very very important treatment for heart failure. Now we know the treatment of heart failure has gone from pre 1980s where we had only diuretics, desoxin as the main therapy. Over a period of time, we have developed ACE inhibitors, ARBs, vasodilators, anodilators. And then we have gone into you know neurohormonal interventions uh, in the 1990s. You know 200 uh, in 2000 came the CRTD, uh, ICDs, left ventricular assist devices, and others. And now in the recent run, we have come with a um, lot of treatment like stem cell therapy, gene therapy. And then uh, probably uh, we have new drugs in last decades like ARNI, and then we have something known as Verisigot, which has been used in treatment to prevent recurrent heart failure. So recently, in last decade, if you ask me, these are the four drugs which have been used, and they are they are they are taking the treatment of heart failure to a new level. Um, other than the drug, the, the the device therapy use has also been increased. Uh, the heart transplants, the number of heart transplant in our country has also gone up very high. Uh, I live in Mumbai, so I know a lot of heart transplants are happening in the city, and the success rate is also quite high. So these are the four new medicines. We will go with uh, the most recent one, that is the ARNI. ARNI is basically a combination of um, angiotensin receptor blocker as well as nepriliceline inhibitors. By combining these two molecules in isomolar amount, what they do is they get an added advantage. By inhibiting the RAS, sodium water retention is reduced, vasoconstriction is reduced, and abnormal hypertrophy is reduced. By nepralysin inhibitors, the natrotrip peptides are elevated in the blood. They causes natrosis, water dilatation, aldosterone suppression is increased, inhibition of fibrosis. So combine this drug has done wonderful. And we needed this drug because the, the predicted burden of heart failure in India is huge. And if you see the prevalence of heart failure in India is 10 million or about 0.9% of total population. And out of which 21 million uh, Indians above the age of 90, 19 years. And then 2.1 million, 8.4 million, um, the reason being the myocardial infarction. And heart failure due to, due to hypertension corresponds to 3.5 to 7 million. And annual mortality due to heart failure is 0.1 to 0.16 million. So that's a huge burden of heart failure in India. And there's a multiple uh, risk uh, factors which increase the prevalence of heart failure in India. That is the, the, the coronary heart disease itself uh, is responsible for huge amount. But as, as we know that we are going through an epidemic of diabetes and hypertension also all over the world, along with obesity, these three factors also increase the prevalence of heart failure in, in, in the country. So why, what is the barrier in manage, what is the problem in, in managing these patients of heart failure in India? Now, the most important is the health system level. I mean, we are, most of the hospitals and places you see that the dedicated system for heart attacks, not for heart failure. You can have the, the strategy to tackle what we will do with the heart attack patient comes, but there is a limited availability of specialized cardiac services for heart failure, limited knowledge, and limited to no availability of support services in patients of heart failure. If you, if you talk about in terms of provided level, the doctor level, doctors have a limited understanding of guideline-directed medical therapy. Please understand that heart failure has a guidelines how to manage these patients. You cannot treat by your own. Of course, you need to use your common sense, you need to use your experience, but you need to stick to guidelines as well. Lack of time for comprehensive discharge education for patients and their family is important. When we discharge, the patient comes and we treat them at the time of discharge. There's not enough understanding of the disease, either to the patient, to the doctor, to the relative. And discharge medications, we, we give it only for a few days, few months. 
And once the medicines are over, patients very often leave the medicine. So that is very, very important. And at the patients and family level, there's a lack of education, a lack of medicine intake, the loss of follow-up, they don't follow up properly. All these things led to uh, the heart failure, poor management. And if you see hospital readmissions are huge in our country, and this is similar across both male and female. They, it is similar across whether for a diastolic heart failure or for, for, for low ear failure. And it is around 30.2% one year hospital readmission rate, which is huge. So 24.4 readmitted at least once and 5.4% admitted more than once. That means that is huge number. So factors increasing hospital readmission, NYHA functioning class at the time of presentation and suboptimal guidance, guideline directed medical therapy. These are the two most important factors which are responsible for readmissions in patients of heart failure. So if the heart failure readmissions are high, that leads to high mortality. So one year mortality rate was significant higher in patients with more than one hospital readmission. So one hospitalization actually increases three times risk of death in patients of heart failure. So in heart failure, it is important that the most important thing is prevent the readmission. So mort mortality outcome at one year, 18%, 1% greatest risk of mortality in first three months when the patient is discharged. 61% death at one year in patients uh, less than 70 years. So can you imagine the mortality happening in the first three months if the patient of heart failure, 18% of the patient die and, and deaths uh, uh, within one year is 61% less than 70 years. So that mortality is, is high and uh, mortality is higher in patients with reduced ejection fraction as compared to patients with diastolic heart failure. So one third of the heart failure patients die within one year during their productive life. That is huge. So factors which increase the mortality include age, history of stroke, higher serum creatinine, suboptimal guideline directed medical therapy, one or more hospital readmission. These are the factors which, which increases the, 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 the mortality. So as the time goes, if you see by 30, 30 days, by 90 days, by one year, by two years, by three years, 46.2% mortality in patients of heart failure. So 50% of the patients almost die by the end of three years in patients with heart failure. So uh, hospitalization uh, represent a major component of overall cost of heart failure expenditure. So 88% of the patients have monthly family income less than 22,000. Cut-off for heart failure has been defined as about 10% of total household expenditure and 40% of the household capacity to pay. That means the patients end up in paying a lot of money for hospitalization. So the, the most important part in the management of heart failure is to reduce the rate of re-hospitalization. For that, we have gone through all the slides. The most important the factor which I want to highlight, highlight is the guideline directed medical therapy. So you have a guideline, you have a checklist at the time of discharge so that no patients, the medicines are missed. So now the, more, the drug which you are talking about is a combination of Secubitril and Valsartan. It is now the class one recommendations in, 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 in all the guidelines, including ACC, AHA, European Society of Cardiology, Indian Association of Heart Failure. And everywhere it is now a class one indication and it has to be preferred renin angiotensin inhibitor um, in patients of all patients with uh, heart failure. So there was a time when patients used to start with ACE inhibitor ARB and then we used to convert this ACE inhibitor and we have been to ARNI, but now the trend is to, to directly go into the RNA. So all the patients of heart failure, if there is no contraindication, should receive the RNA uh, in, 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 in patients. So uh, this drug was available previously a decade earlier. It was not available in India, but now it is freely available in India with various names like Vimada, Asmada, Sigmas. There are so many names. So this medicine should be uses, used in patients of uh, heart failure. It has proven benefit in clinical trials across all the patients with heart failure. In paradigm heart failure, this was responsible for 20% reduction in primary outcome of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. Proof heart failure trials, significant improvement in cardio, cardiac reverse modeling. 
and reduction in antiprobian p after 12 months and pioneer heart failure trial initiation of rna during acute decompensive heart failure is feasible it's superior outcomes as compared to enalapril so that these are the three trials which which you know clearly states that the rna should be preferred first line therapy significant improvement in nyha function class occurred as early as one month of follow up with sacubitril valsartan combination that is rna significant improvement in 6 minute mock test as early as one month was seen in patients both with chronic congestive heart failure and acute decompensative heart failure in patients with sacubitril valsartan and sacubitril valsartan in setting of acute decompensative heart failure or chronic congestive heart failure setting result in significant clinical biochemical and functional improvement in patients of heart failure at one month another drug which is which has come in india as a trade name of verico or the actual chemical name is verisigon it also it's also acts through nitric oxide cyclic gmp so this also has been used it reduces the inflammation it is a good drug which acts on the heart as well as it it, it acts on the on the kidneys in heart it reduces the inflammation reduces the fibrosis reduces the hypertrophy that means it prevents the remodeling blood vessels it decreases the inflammation and increases the vasodilatation and in kidneys it reduces the fibrosis and increases the blood flow so this has been approved by fda and right now this class 2b indication in treatment of heart failure most importantly it is used for prevention of readmissions in patient of heart failure well uh, in all the patients of heart failure we usually recommend these patients to be vaccinated if you see the patients admissions of these patients of heart failure most of the time it, it starts with the flu like symptoms they start with a viral infection that is why it is recommended that all the patients of heart failure should have a vaccination done with the flu vaccine every yearly and a pneumococcal vaccine once in a once in a year that was the one of the reasons why we have lot of mortality and morbidity in the patients who have heart failure who, who got covid so that is why the vaccination is very very important once in a year flu vaccine Uh, and then once in a lifetime pneumococcal vaccine so to conclude use guideline directed medical therapy make sure all other conventional drugs like beta blockers diuretics mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists like ipilimron other drugs like ivapradine are used along with the arni and if you cannot use arni asymmetry of arni